<clears throat> the reading <clears throat> this morning is John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, found on page 1065 in the Church Bible. <clears throat> now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nic Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see this, the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to, to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we uh, give thanks for Dean. We pray for your anointing on him now as he shares uh, the message that you've laid on his heart from your word. So give us ears to hear and heart, may our hearts and minds be open to receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm not going to actually preach on the famous um, scripture in this. It'll be a basically about Nicodemus. So what does it mean to be born again? That's really the title for today's talk. That phrase, being born again, or becoming a born again Christian, causes lots of misunderstanding and confusion. And we can see that in Nicodemus. And um, we're going to be focusing on Nicodemus' story. And um, I'm going to try and learn what he learned and how he was changed by encounters with the Lord through these passages. Now, Nicodemus is mentioned three times in the Bible. The most significant is in today's reading. But he also has significant mentions in John 7.50, which we will look at shortly, and in John 19. So let's follow Nicodemus' journey, his journey of stumbling and confusion, and also onto his journey of faith. So who is or was Nicodemus? Well, verse 1 tells us that he was a Pharisee and a member of the ruling council. Now, a Pharisee was a legalistic and an exclusivist group who strictly, but often hypocritically, kept the law of Moses and the unwritten traditions of the elders. Now, whilst some Pharisees, no doubt, were godly, 
most of them came into conflict with Jesus because they were hypocritical and they were envious and they were rigid and formalistic. They were hardly a group of people who were open to the Holy Spirit or indeed to what God was doing. And that's really kind of a key point we're going to be talking about today. They were not open to what the Lord was doing in their midst. They believed that God's grace only extended to those who kept his law. The insiders, as it were, their holy clique. So that's what the Pharisees were. That's why Jesus really came into lots of conflict with them. Because he didn't like their hypocrisy and the narrowness of their faith. Now, clearly, something was happening to Nicodemus. He was probably a reasonably old man, and he'd been trained and brought up in the ways of a Pharisee. So that was his life. In fact, he would have been much the same as Saul, stroke Paul. Paul was brought up in those Pharisee ways, and he'd been schooled over many, many years, had the best teachers, and that was his life. So Nicodemus probably had echoes of some of those things that we saw in, we, we see in Paul. So Nicodemus, no doubt, shared these views, these pharisaic views, and the outlook as well. But we read about Nicodemus, that he came to Jesus at night and said the following. He said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs that you were doing if God wasn't with you. So what's taking place here? Why the softening of Nicodemus' heart? He was clearly on a journey. Now Nicodemus had clearly been hearing and observing what was going on around him. And he saw and heard, what he saw and what he heard clearly con conflicted with what he believed. So what he saw with his own eyes and heard about Jesus, i.e. what God was doing, he was open to that. He noticed. And he could see that there was a tension. There was a tension in the core of his being in reality in terms of what he believed and what he saw and heard. Now, one of the passages that really struck me when I was reading through what Pharisees believed in was their belief concerning God's grace. And they, own, they believed that it only extended to those who followed and kept the law of Moses. They believed that God's grace was limited to the law, to the law keepers. And that's what... Nicodemus would have believed that God's grace was limited. And it, you only received God's grace if you kept the law. The law are Le uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and onwards and the traditions of the elders. If you ticked those boxes, then God was happy with you. And his grace extended to you if you did this. Yet Nicodemus saw Jesus doing lots of miracles. And to quote what Jesus said to the disciples of John the Baptist, he said the following, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now, as I said, these miracles and miraculous events clearly were at odds with what he, Nicodemus, had believed up until this point. The people who were being healed and forgiven were not the insiders. They were blatantly the outsiders. People like lepers, tax collectors, prostitutes, Samaritans, and even, we can say, God forbid, from his point of view, even the Romans. That's really scraping the barrel from their perspective. No wonder, Nicodemus said, no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with you. 
So what can we learn from Nicodemus so far? Well, he was open to what was God, that God was doing around him. His eyes weren't closed. Yes, he was confused, as we will see later. But he is acknowledging what Jesus is doing. And he recognizes that God is behind this somehow. Although he doesn't quite know how to fit it all together. He is starting to discover that God's grace is not limited to the insiders, but to all people. As I say, remember that Jesus healed both non-Pharisee Jews and shock horror Gentiles also. So Nicodemus is troubled and confused. and thinking, what is happening here? Something is happening, but what? So what about us, you and me? You know, are we noticing what Jesus is doing in the lives around us? You and I know a lot of people. What is the Lord doing there? What is the Lord doing in their lives? The church outsiders. Now, do we limit God's grace to those who are inside the church? Or are we open to God's grace to all people, non-Christian friends, our work colleagues, our family members even, people of other faiths or no faith, people who are not like us in class and lifestyle, for example, and people who are difficult to like, let alone love. And we all know those people. What's the Lord doing there? I think sometimes it's very easy to assume that God is doing nothing in those people. But I think certainly if you were, unless you were, let's say, born, I always kind of make a judgment really about people who've been born into Christian families, because that's just so very different from my own experience. So it's easier for me to speak from uh, non-Christian families. Now, was the Lord working in the Tony family? Well, he must have, because I wouldn't be here. What about the non-believers? Is the Lord, is, is the Lord capable of turning people's lives around, the outsiders? And it is sometimes very easy, and I think about certain members of my family, oh, will they ever believe? And like, it's, it's quite easy to despair sometimes. I hope my dad doesn't listen to this. And, um, <laughs> but there are people we can very easily write off in our, work, in our work colleagues and people around us. But the Lord is bigger than that. And after all, he did turn around poor stroke Saul. And that would have been, should have been a fairly hard nut to crack, I suspect. Our Heavenly Father, speaking from Christchurch's perspective, our Heavenly Father is currently revealing his vision for Christchurch Bushmead. And this is going to involve us having a much wider vision than we've had for a while. The Lord doesn't give small visions. And we're trying to go for a process of what is the Lord saying to us at Christchurch? Who are we? Where are we going as a church? That vision is not going to be small. It might start small, but the vision, the activities might start small. But the vision will be big, and it'll be part of something bigger. It won't be just Christchurch Bushmead. It will fit into Luton and the nations, etc. So we need to be open to where God is leaving us as a church. We need to start noticing what the Lord is already doing around us. And we can be confident that he is already at work. We need to keep our eyes open and our hearts open. And we need to kind of try not to be, and I'm not saying we are like this, not to be like the Pharisees who in particular were jealous. They were jealous of Jesus and his ministry. And they were very rigid. And they were very formulaic. And I don't think the Lord works through formulas. As, we, as the Bible, as this passage talks about, the Holy Spirit goes where he goes. That's not a formula. So we just need to have our little eyes and our hearts open. What is the Lord doing at Christ Church? 
What's he already started? Now, we, like Nicodemus, might not necessarily find this process easy to understand and to walk. This was not a comfortable place that Nicodemus was in. What he believed conflicted, well, what Jesus was doing conflicted with what Nicodemus believed. And he was trying to work through that. So, Nicodemus, what about him? He has questions. Questions are really good. Much of the beginning of Jesus' mission was that of sowing. Indeed, he did that parable, didn't he? The parable of the sower. And Jesus attracted large crowds with his presence and his ministry. And say, just like the parable of the sower, Jesus scattered many seeds, some of which landed on fertile soil. The majority didn't. Now, I think it's quite interesting. I've been reading about this. We tend to assume that, you know, oh, Jesus just spoke loads of words and lots of people kind of got gathered up into that. And we tend to think about when we sow seeds, not many of them land on fertile soil. But I think Jesus was talking as much about himself as to his disciples. I think Jesus spread loads of words of encouragement and parables. And the majority of that landed on dry, barren, rocky soil. And I hadn't really thought about that previously. About a medium number of people responded to Jesus' invitation, and they drew closer to him. And we can call these people searchers. Jesus spoke in parables. People kind of got wrapped up into things. They've always known this, this chap called Jesus of Nazareth is in town. Let's go and listen to what he says. Don't forget there's no television at this point. So let's go and see some entertainment. Let's see what's everyone being drawn along to. So let's go and follow. And Jesus would have spoken to the crowds. And some of those words would have landed on really good soil. Much of it didn't. So they were out of that body, out of that small group of people. They wanted a little bit more. What Jesus had said kind of did something to them. It kind of piqued their interest or touched their hearts. And we can call these people searchers. And Nicodemus was one of these people. So what is a searcher? A searcher is someone who's looking for a bit more a bit more depth or meaning, or a bit more hope in a darkening future, perhaps a bit more help in their life struggles, or a bit more love from someone. According to uh, Yvonne Richards in her book, Evangelism in a Spiritual Age, she says, people today have big questions. And sometimes those questions emerge into their lives and demand attention. And this can lead to a re-evaluation of life and lifestyle. Most of the time, she's saying that these questions lie quietly under the surface. And we tend to kind of live with them. But sometimes they really bubble up according to life events or what we're hearing. So the virus is going to do that for some people. What is the Lord doing in that How can he possibly allow that to happen? There will be people who will be asking questions about the Lord in this. Some will say we can't, you know, God would never allow this to happen, so there can't be a God. Some people will say that. But other people will be a little bit more open to what is the Lord doing in this situation. Now, I think Nicodemus kind of echoes this. I think he had big questions in his lives, in his life. He certainly had one there, Jesus and the Pharisee views. But I think there were other questions underneath that. I don't actually think Nicodemus was particularly satisfied. You know, he'd been probably a Pharisee, I'm speculating now, but he'd been a Pharisee all his life. He'd been taught up into rigid rules and lifestyle, and he'd have seen lots of need outside. And I'm not sure his T 
teaching and what he'd learned totally satisfied him. I think he was still hungry. And here comes Jesus, gathering crowds, doing miraculous signs, speaking words of life. And somehow it was resonating or doing something in Nicodemus. But I don't think he was satisfied. So what happens? So Nicodemus, the searcher, sneaks out in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness and seeks an audience with Jesus himself. Do you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sometimes, oh, you know, why did he do it at night? I don't care when he does it. He's done it. He has gone out and sought Jesus. What's wrong with that? Searchers don't always want to draw attention to the fact that they have spiritual questions. You may have been like that yourself. It is quite embarrassing when you live in a kind of a non-Christian family and it's not part of your faith or your circle of friends and you have kind of little questions and things that are kind of tweaking it, piquing your interest. Because suddenly, if you're going down, your friends say, well, why are you doing that? Oh, you're starting to go to church now. It can be all a little bit embarrassing. And it's kind of a big step. But Nicodemus isn't quite there yet. He's on a journey. So you may have had people sneak up to you and ask you questions at work or elsewhere. And they haven't made a big song and dance of it. In fact, they might have asked you for prayers. I've had atheist people do that to me. Oh, do you mind? And I've got Muslim friends. Oh, don't forget to pray for me. And they won't make a big song and dance of it. It'll be done on the quiet, where there is a very little attention. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Just to be, o- be open to that. Because there may be people who will come to you and just ask you things. So Nicodemus catches up with Jesus and he tells him that he thinks he has come from God. Wow, that's great. I think you come from God. That's what he says to Jesus. And he says, I recognize the fact that God is doing lots of miraculous signs for you. That's a good start. So what does Jesus do next? He confuses him further. That's what Jesus does. So Nicodemus says, sorry, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And poor old Nicodemus, what's he supposed to do with that? How can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, his mother's womb, to be born. Well, that's just great, isn't it? That was really helpful. Jesus was great then, wasn't he? There's someone who's seeking, snuck out in the middle of the night. He compliments Jesus. He says, yeah, you know, God is doing something there. And then Jesus kind of makes something really difficult. He says, well, you know, you've got to be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of, the kingdom of God. Have you ever noticed that Jesus often makes belief in him difficult? If you read the Gospels, he does not make it easy. He almost put in every obstacle possible. Okay, he's going around his thing, sowing seeds, doing miracles. Those are all great. And then if you have a little chit-chat with you, mm, that's it. You're in trouble. He makes it difficult. Jesus never hands it over on a plate this faith business. You never just say, here you are. Oh, thanks. He makes people work for it. Faith is a gift of God and that you have to choose to receive and choose to believe. It is there, but it's not going to fall in your lap. If you read the Gospel of Mark, you will find the disciples were confused and bewildered the majority of the time. To the crowds, Jesus spoke in parables so that they would would have to chew his words over. 
and to help them become seekers and ask more questions. The questions should never really stop. You should always continue to have questions. Because God does, you know, he's not, we're not simple in that sense. He wants us, he, he, he's created us in his own image, he's given us capacity to think. We're not to be sort of, what's that phrase? Um, I've lost it now when people think that Christians are um, brainwashed. That's the thing I'm looking for. That we need to be sort of brainwashed. Actually, it's nothing of the sort. The Lord wants us to think and to chew over his word and to go to questions with him and to speak to each other about them. There's nothing about brainwashed at all. We're thinking people. And you don't switch off your thinking and your intelligence when you walk through the door and you open the Bible. You chew it over. You ask more questions. And so Jesus continues this process with Nicodemus. Jesus doesn't want the crowd whipped up into some sort of great frenzy into believing in him as some sort of cultural thing or activity. Hi, Ian, I'm taking the mickey now. He doesn't want us to be like good middle-class people going to church because that's what good middle-class people do. That's not what it's about. That's a, that, that used to happen here in terms of a cultural thing. You went to church because culturally you did that. I've got loads of Muslim friends and, co- and colleagues and students, and I think as much of their faith is a cultural thing. They do it because the culture does it. And I think we've had, Christianity has had this in this country. That's what you did. That's what good people did. They went to church. They went once a week, and that was it. There was a very little God on Saturday, Monday to Saturday. It was a ticking box on a Sunday. Now, that's not all Christians, clearly. But the Lord doesn't want that. Jesus wants much more than that. It's about discipleship. Jesus deserves much more than going to church because it's a cultural thing to do. Now, I feel sorry for Nicodemus because he's in the... But we, it kind of works out all right in the end, but that's a, that's a tough place for him to be. He's having this tough conversation and he's struggling. Now, I think Jesus had different expectations for, for him than he would for the people he met outside. So I'm not saying that we need to purposely confuse our friends and family when we talk about Jesus. I think Jesus is doing this to Nicodemus because his expectations were higher. He was a teacher of Israel who'd been brought up in scriptures, who's read them countless times and yet seems to have not understood them. And this is what Jesus is upset about. That's why he's giving him a hard time and being slightly frank with him. Now, you and I need to expect people to ask us questions. And the really good thing is, do you know, you don't always need to have all the answers. Sometimes when people ask you questions about your faith, you often come, oh, if only I'd said that, and, you know, when you've had time to think about it, it would have been so much polished if I'd have kind of thought about it, if you'd give me some notice. Can you write them down in future? And um, and I can go away and get ready. And they don't, people don't want that, because they're going to sneak up to you, aren't they? And it's going to be totally unexpected, and they're going to want something. They're going to make some sort of observation. And, yeah, you can answer some questions from your own personal experience and what the Lord means to you and what you've learned. But don't feel kind of sad when you can't answer all the questions. And it might be quite good to leave them with a question and get them to work it out and allow them to continue to think about it when your conversation has stopped. So don't bang yourself over the head. Oh, you know, if only you did what you did, the Lord was in that, we have to believe that the Holy Spirit has given you the words and you've done your best, allow the, God, allow the Lord to do the rest. He's the one who converts. He's the one that changes people's hearts. Allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to do, continue what he started in that, person, in that, in that seeker 
if you can call it that. So don't get yourself down when you haven't been perfect. The Lord can use all things for, for good. So the main bit of this is what does Jesus mean by being born again? Okay, so looking at this passage in John 3, we see that being born again is not physical birth. All the ladies will be very pleased about that. But it is about experience of spiritual renewal. It's an expression that de- it's an, it is an expression that defines the moment or process of fully accepting faith in Jesus Christ. It is an experience when the teaching of Jesus become real and the born again acquire a personal relationship with God. That is what being born again is. It's when you're moving on to a relationship with God, with Jesus. Now, a lot of people have the idea that to become a Christian is simply about believing certain Christian things. And we've read some of those today. We've said those uh, today during the service, the creed. And those are very helpful, and there are Christian things that we need to believe. But it's more than that. It's not just a statement of tick, 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 I believe in that. It is much more. It actually means that the life of God actually coming into a person who has been dead towards God and now making this person alive to him so that he lives in you. So in essence, it is a relationship. The problem with a list of rules like the Pharisees is that it's dead. Nicodemus was spiritually dead and so were those Pharisees. They knew a lot. They ticked boxes. Be like us just learning the Apostles' Creed. Yeah, I must be a Christian because I've learned the Apostles' Creed and I can say the Lord's Prayer and I know the Ten Commandments. And then you could just add them on. Now, I'm not sure I can do all those, but the point is you could just learn those things. I mean, yeah, I'm a Christian, um, but you're not born again at that point because it's more than that. It's about heart. It's about the relationship. That's what it's about. It's about a walk, a journey with God. And that is why Jesus says that I am the vine and you are the branches. Being a Christian is, it's not like Jesus being over here and I'm over there. It is about that actually you're abiding in him And we've had a lot of preaching on John 15 about the vine and the branches. We are to abide in him. It is that the life of Christ actually comes into the experience of the one who is a Christian believer. The new birth is the start of that beginning to happen. Okay, God gave himself. That was a personal thing. We gave, he stepped down, there was his son, and he died for us. That is, and he did that for you and me personally. So are you born again? Do you know what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus in your own life? Was Nicodemus born again? Well, at this point, he probably wasn't. He was on a journey of spiritual awakening. And he needed time to think and process what Jesus had said to him. And he needed the Holy Spirit to continue to work in him, to open his eyes and soften his heart towards God. What do we know about Nicodemus? What we know about Nicodemus was that sometime later, John 7:50 records, 
It records him speaking up for Jesus at a meeting of the chief priests and Pharisees. And he questions their decision to condemn Jesus without first hearing him to find out what he was doing. He told them that they were acting unlawfully. And obviously this didn't go down very well in that meeting. He was um, rebuked, rebuffed, and it would have been a very uncomfortable situation for him. But Nicodemus was prepared to go against the grain and not call popularity. The Holy Spirit is working in Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is starting to walk with Jesus. One of the things I have to always have to think about myself, you know, in my own life, do I speak up about Jesus when it's uncomfortable? And the answer is sometimes. The final mention of Nicodemus is in John 19. And I'm just going to read out that section. It says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, but secretly because he feared the Jews. So with Pilate's permission, accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night, Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and in strips of linen. This was in, this was in accordance with the Ju- Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was near, they laid, it, they laid Jesus there. So, what do we know about Nicodemus following on from this passage? Well, one, Nicodemus was closely associated with other disciples who were also members of the Sanhedrin and who had not agreed to the condemnation of Jesus. So there were like-minded people about him, around him. That 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes were a large amount such such as was used during royal burials. So it was a big sacrifice. Jesus' followers had run away at this point, and it was left to Joseph and Nicodemus to provide for the burial. It was Nicodemus and um, Joseph who buried Jesus, not the disciples. Where were they? And so all these things are pointing to the risks that Nicodemus was taking. Was he born again? Probably. (laughs) Or he may be still on his journey. But the Lord is definitely doing something there in him. Okay, so draw the sermon to to a close. Nicodemus was a searcher, someone who was looking for a bit more, a bit more depth, a bit more hope, and a bit more help in his life struggles. Who do you know around you who may be searching for a bit more. You might want to think about that when you go to work and your family. You know, who around you do you think is searching? Number two, Nicodemus' original view of God's grace was that it was very narrow and small. In what ways do we demonstrate that God's grace is actually abounding and it's wide and it's available to everyone? Do we do that? And number three, to finish on, do you know what it means to be born again in your own life? Amen.